Hey, how's it going? We're actually gonna start on time today for, for once. Today, I'm gonna do something a little bit different than how I normally do in a YouTube Live. And that is I'm starting off by answering questions that were pre-submitted, we'll say, but they were submitted through comments on our regular YouTube videos. Um, honestly, there's a couple reasons for that. One is I get a lot of questions anyway, and it's hard to answer them all just like typing out a response. A lot of them just take more than what you're gonna wanna type out, especially if you're responding on your phone. Um, and so I wanted to not skip over those questions, but um, also in doing so, uh, and in inviting you to comment and ask questions right there on our videos, it got a lot more comments. I got a lot more engagement from you and um, that helps with the YouTube algorithm, but it also helps me just know that like we're, we're there, we're having a conversation. So anyway, that's the kind of the why. So I know that there's already questions coming in in the live and those of you who are here early asking those questions, I will definitely be coming back to those. Uh, so don't don't worry about that. But I do want to start with some questions that were pre-submitted and I do have quite a few. So we'll probably bounce back and forth a little bit. All right. So starting off, here's what I've got. I got a question here from um, at AO Wanders. It says, do you have any tips or plugin recommendations to stop your WordPress site from creating multiple photos of one picture? For this, the easiest thing to do will actually be to share my screen. So here we go. Okay, if you can see that. Um, all right, so I'm gonna go to, this is cookforfolks.com. What's going on here is whenever you upload a picture to WordPress, WordPress is gonna generate automatically, there's the original image you uploaded, they're gonna generate three more. They're gonna generate a small thumbnail one, a medium sized one, and one that they call large. And that large one's kind of like big enough really for web rendering. Um, and then you really only want the original size image which also probably shouldn't be massive if you're doing like a full width background photo or something like that. Um, but there may be some instances where you want to control what images are being created because all of the copies of that image are being stored in your, in your uh, hosting. And so it can be taking up space. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to the back end of a website on WordPress. You don't need a plugin for this. Uh, then we are going to go to settings and media right here this is the sizes you get to choose what size you want those different images to be in pixels and then it will generate them for you if you replace all of the numbers with zero um all of them you know zero 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 across the board which i'm not going to do but if you want if you do that you uh, uh wordpress is not going to generate new image uh those new images for you so problem solved okay um Good question though. That's not one that I had really thought about before or worried about. So I looked it up real quick for you. <laughs> All right. By the way, pre-submitting questions helps with that as well um, because it allows me to sometimes look into things that I don't immediately have the answer for, but that I could quickly find. Um, all right, we'll switch back to just me. Thomas uh, at Thomas Beeman 4243 says in rank math, I see many options, even with pro, but I don't see an option for organizational schema. So what should you use to create organizational schema? I noticed the same thing with rank math. It actually kind of annoyed me that it didn't have um, built into it a organizational schema. I think organizational schema is really valuable for our websites to help sort of establish for Google that we are like a real person or a real organization, I mean. And so I think we should add it to our website. So I'm gonna show you how we do this manually. I've gone ahead and done it this way. Um, in our Akabata WordPress theme, we have organizational schema built in. There are plugins that will allow you to do this too. Uh, schema Pro, as well as, I'll show you here, this is, um, this is technicalseo.com. They have their schema markup generator and it does a good job. And this is how we're gonna generate it manually. But, um, even they say they have this schema app that you can use to generate it, okay? But let me show you how we do this. So you just go to technicalseo.com. I just Google schema markup generator every time. I can never remember what the website is and I don't bookmark it because I don't use it that often. Organization schema, by the way, you only really need to create really once on a website uh, unless you wanna change your organizational schema. And we're only gonna put it in one place on the website and we're gonna go through that real quick. So here, 
I just put in the fields that I want. So are we an airline, a consortium, a corporation, a funding scheme? Um, really, for most of us, yep, we, I mean, it could be that you are building a website for a project and that makes sense or a performing group. But for most of us, it's just organization, just generic. And then what's the name of your organization? Well, I'm going to name my organization Cook for Folks. It's kind of how I'm doing business as on that website. Um, I could say that the organization is Income School because Income School owns the website Cook for Folks. So that's, uh, that's the choice there. What's the web address? So cookforfolks.com. The logo URL. So if I go to my media library where I've got the logo for my website, I can just click this little copy URL. So this is just Cook for Folks Media Library. And then I searched logo. <laughs> then I'm going to paste that. That's cool because it's going to allow um, Google and other search engines to be able to quickly find the official logo for the organization. You'd think that would be pretty easy for them to do anyway, since we specifically set up like the logo in a specific place on the website. But um, that just helps make it easy for them. Then we have the option to add social media profiles. So if I have a Facebook, an Instagram, and when we do that, it's adding this same as tag. So it's saying like, this is the same cook for folks as this other YouTube channel or this Facebook page. So you can paste the URL for those accounts here. And then if you wanted to, you could add like a contact phone number for billing support or customer service. If you have a, a phone number for that, you could put that here. What that's doing, if you look, is over here on the right, it's generating a big script. Well, this is actually not that big. We click this little button and it's going to copy that for us. Now let's go back to Cook for Folks and I'm just going to visit the site. Organization schema, I typically like to put on the about, like the about the website page, the about the organization. If you haven't created an about page, you can go ahead and put it on your home page for now. All right, then, so I'll click edit page. This is, this is just so much easier than I ever thought it was when I first started. Um, I was like, schema, where do we put it? How do we, no, just add a block here. Um, custom HTML, that's what we want. And then we're literally just going to paste that code here as custom HTML. It's not going to show anything on the front end. You won't see it at all, but it's going to add this HTML code to the page. And so now this, uh, this is going to be here. So if I just click update, it's going to add that code. Now we have organization schema on this website. Uh, that's it. That's how we do it. Okay. I know that was a little bit longer answer to a question, but I wanted to cover a couple of those things. I get a lot of questions around schema markup. Um, because I know it's a fairly, uh, fairly complicated thing, especially if you're kind of new to that. Once you sort of understand it, it's not that hard. All right. Um, all right. All right. Lots of questions coming in. So I'll come back to some of these uh, in a few minutes, but I'm going to answer just a couple more that I think I can do quickly from uh, comments. All right. This one is about actually the new, uh, more recent Google algorithm update in August with the algorithm update, Google released some uh, updates about FAQ schema and FAQ rich results. So the question here is, should I add answers to FAQs throughout the blog post that has the same intent all on the same page? Or should I cover them up in a fresh piece of a fresh article? So FAQ schema by the way, uh, an FAQ rich results where basically Google's going to show uh, FAQ, you know, question and answer right there uh, as a result uh, in the SERP. That is now being reserved for what Google called uh, high authority medical and government sites. So FAQ schema and FAQ rich results are not going to appear for most of our blogs anymore. Uh, so Google said basically FAQ schema doesn't really do anything for you, uh, but you don't need to go remove it from your website. If you have FAQ schema on your site, it's fine. Just leave it alone, but you're not going to get those rich results anymore in the SERP. I'm not that worried about that. From an SEO standpoint, uh, answering multiple FAQs in the same article, if they're closely related is totally fine. If you have separate pieces of content that cover different aspects and some of those FAQs would fit better with one article and others would fit better with another, it's also okay to split them up. 
I don't think that every FAQ necessarily needs to be in its own article is kind of my point. Um, we don't get a lot of value from a, again, a rich results standpoint. We don't get a lot of value from formatting things as FAQs anymore for most of us bloggers, but, um, but still like clearly structuring a question and then a clear answer to that question is a great way to help ensure that you're going to rank well for that question when somebody types that into the search. So it's still a good format. Just make sure that whatever questions you're trying to rank for, that we answer them reasonably thoroughly. So there are some things that people would put in an FAQ that I would potentially write a whole response post for, but not always. Sometimes it only merits a paragraph or even a few sentences. So there you go. Um, all right, then another question I got here is what to do when you get stuck. This is someone who has a point, uh, this is at Assorted Meeples. They have 550 articles and counting, but the traffic is basically where it's at, where it was when they had 275. Uh, so how do you deal with those plateaus? How do you break through them? If I see something like this happening, the first thing I do is try to understand what's going on. So if the traffic hasn't improved, even though we've almost doubled the content, then it's possible that one of a few different things is happening. First, we could be actually cannibalizing some of our traffic. That's not always a, a bad thing. So, so here's the thing. A lot of times when you have fewer articles, you have an article that will rank for a lot of different search queries, even though it doesn't really cover that search query that well. And depending on how competitive it is, you might be getting quite a bit of traffic for it. The thing is that that traffic, those people, are not as satisfied with your article as they would be if there was one that was totally on point for them. So when we write a new article that covers their real question more thoroughly, that's a better experience for that user, but it also takes some of that traffic away from the, the earlier article that we wrote, if that makes sense. So that's not always a bad thing, but in terms of actual traffic, it's, uh, it's not easy to tell that, um, that that's what's happening. The other thing that could be happening is that some of your early content is not ranking as well as it once was. And so as you write new content, um, basically things are just kind of constantly moving up and down. So I think it's really valuable to, when you're hitting kind of a plateau, you've been there for a while and you have a lot of content, it does make sense to do some analysis. It makes sense to use Google Search Console and to use Google Analytics to identify what content is doing well, what's not. If you have 550 articles, Whereas before when you had 275, like in both cases, 10 articles made up half your traffic and now it's still the same 10 articles. Well, now we know that there's maybe another problem too. And there's a good chance that maybe Google's determined that you're pretty authoritative in this one area or a couple of areas, but you've maybe strayed too far from that. Or maybe you're just doubling down too much in that one area and you've already saturated it with content. See, there's a lot of things that could be going on. So at this point, I usually like to take a step back and identify maybe what the main causes are, and that helps me figure out what to do about it. The other thing you can do is just try to do something a little bit different. So instead, you've got lots of content. Instead of continuing to just add more and more and more, it's a great time to go try to do more industry outreach, build that EEAT, maybe consider adding a social media platform. If you don't wanna do video on YouTube, that's understandable. Maybe you do go the kind of the Instagram, Facebook route, and you do, um, you do create maybe a group that people can participate in and you can engage with others uh, in your niche. Maybe you start creating some reels, just a little short vertical videos. Uh, there's a lot of different options that you could do that would diversify a little bit where your traffic is coming from, as well as kind of build your authority. And so anyway, there's uh, lots of things you could do. But basically, if ever I feel like I'm at a plateau, I like to slow down and take a minute and just look at things and determine if either I need to just kind of keep pushing through to get through the plateau, or if maybe it's time to, to try maybe a different approach for a little while. Not to say don't ever add more content, but just maybe try a different approach. One more here and then I'll take a couple from the chat. So Kyle and uh, Karina Holden, 7515 asks, is it okay to post to add a blog post under two different categories and or subcategories on the blog if it fits, or should you only pick one? So one of the big concerns that people had 
with putting one blog post in multiple categories on a website was duplicate content. Would Google look at that and say, um, you know, oh, you've got duplicate content on your website. That's that's bad. <laughs> Google has basically said for a while now, that's not considered duplicate content. On the other hand, if your website is relatively small um, and you have categories on your website with fewer than about seven articles in them, and some of those articles are being repeated across multiple categories, if you go to apply for Google AdSense or for any ad, um, any like you wanna put ads on your website and you go with any of the ad providers out there, all of them are using Google Ad Manager, their, their platform there to get their ads and Google has to approve the quality of your website. And one of the big things that we've seen Google reject is when a site has categories with fewer than seven articles, seven was the number that they um, gave us. I think it's kind of a rule of thumb, but fewer than about seven articles. And if they saw articles being repeated across multiple, they thought that it was kind of you trying to manipulate Google into thinking you had more content than you really do. So that's the danger there. If you have your websites kind of being built out, you have a fair amount of content now. Um, these categories that you're going to duplicate it across have more than about seven blog posts in them then yes, I think it makes complete sense if the users are gonna use those category archive pages um, to find content, like put it where it, it fits, even if that's across multiple categories. That's my thought on it. All right, here we go. I'm gonna go to the chat now. Um, Halima Butt says, what's an effective strategy for finding a low competition micro niche um, and thoughts on the Google algorithm update? I'll give some thoughts on that update because I know that's probably the, question I've seen the most. Finding a low competition micro niche is, it can be pretty tough. I mean, you can try to use um, keyword research tools that are going to estimate traffic and search volume numbers. Uh, you can use those to, to try to find something. And I think that's a great way to brainstorm. I just always do my best to sort of verify both in my own brain as well as um, through like Google Trends and stuff to try to just verify any of that. But um, mostly we've had the greatest success by using the internet ourselves and literally going to the internet with the questions we actually have. And then every now and then we just, every time we come across something where we're just like, there's not a good answer to this question. There's a problem I'm trying to solve. There's a hobby I'm trying to get into, whatever that is. And the questions I'm asking are not well answered on the internet. And so when you start having to dive in deeper and just not getting the answers that you're seeking, that is a, that's a, that's a really good sign that that's a good niche opportunity. It's, it can be tough to come at this and say, well, I want to pick a niche, a, a micro niche or any sort of like a niche of any size and say, well, let me just analyze and find the best one. There's not a really amazing way to do that. Um, the landscape is constantly changing. There's new sites going up all the time. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's just constantly changing. And keyword research tools, again, can, can help you with that. Ahrefs and SEMrush, they, they have tools that can help you identify valuable keywords with low competition, but again, um, and valuable topics with relatively low competition. But I just find that oftentimes, um, whether you're using the tools or you're just trying to do it yourself, um, oftentimes you're gonna, any niche on the surface is gonna look really competitive these days. But usually it's when we actually dive in and start doing real searches, real research based upon the questions we actually have in our real lives that we discover um, the really big opportunities. The other thing that that does is it helps you pick niches that actually mean something to you. It's if you wouldn't have come across it if you weren't searching it, uh, which usually means that you have some level of interest in it. And I find that that's actually probably more important than finding something ultra low competition. All right, let's talk about the update. Um, everything I've seen on the update, and this is it's just kind of, a, it's weird, okay? Um, but everything I've seen shows that a relatively, relatively, I know those of you who are impacted aren't gonna feel this way, a relatively small number of sites were impacted compared to other algorithm updates, but those that were impacted seem to have been impacted in a large way. So if you were hit, um, you probably got hit hard. And that's just, 
that always awful, right? Um, and every time that we have a major algorithm update, the same th I hear the same thing from everyone. They say, my content got replaced with content that's not as good. Uh, and that does happen a lot. So here's my advice with this algorithm update, and it just doesn't differ that much from others. Um, but there are a couple things that I'll say maybe more specifically about helpful content. Um, but when an algorithm update happens like this, I know it's been a, a little bit since it finished, Google finished rolling it out, but even so, the SERPs are not settled, okay? It's gonna take a bit for this to play out. And with every algorithm update, it gets pushed out and there's, there's a certain amount of kind of quality control that's happening at this point. Um, you know, the Google engineers, they don't really know, like they're smart people, right? But when they push something out, they don't really know exactly what it's gonna do because search is so complex. The different things that people are searching for just, and the whole algorithm is very complex. And so when they push out an update that tends to lead toward making the search worse, <laughs> there's usually some corrective action that happens or a little bit of a rollback. That's not uncommon. Um, but if overall the search experience seems to be the same or better, they're probably not gonna change it. So basically what I'm saying is we don't wanna just immediately make r large changes on our website. We wanna methodically look at things and look at what Google's trying to do. So with helpful content, I said I'd come back to that. With helpful content, Google is trying to reduce the amount of redundant content that shows up at the top of the SERP. Redundant meaning like, when you have 17 articles that all say the same thing, only one of those really needs to appear. And so where it used to be that you would have five or six blog posts that were very similar right there at the top of the SERP, now Google's like, well, and by the way, all five of them got traffic, right, before. Well, now Google's like, well, I only need one, maybe two of those because really they all say the same thing. And really we as bloggers did this to ourselves because what do most bloggers do? They use other blog posts as all of the, like the entire source of their research. And that's what happens when we write blog content about stuff we don't know anything about. We have a tendency to just repeat what other people say using different words. AI is also doing the exact same thing. If you're using AI to completely write your content and you're not adding, not even just like personal anecdotes or personality, if you're not adding like some other type of original research or something of value that is a, adds additional help for the user beyond the other content that's already kind of on, we'll call it page one, even though now it's kind of infinite scroll. Um, chance, the chances of you showing up on page one now have, have been declining every time Google pushes out more of the helpful content thing. So it's not just about your content not being bad. It's about your content having originality as well and adding something above and beyond the other articles that are already there um, at the top of the SERP. So I think that's a big part of what happened is that if you were ranking number three or four before, but your article is really similar to the ones ranking just above it, you used to get good traffic even though you were number three or four. Now you're not even anywhere near the top. And that's, I think, what happened to a lot of people. And that's, again, been rolling out for a couple of years now, um, this helpful content stuff. So shoot for originality, create content that you know something about so that you can add some original value. Um, all right, I had a question here from Wasim Chaudhary, uh, Chaudhary, 3138. What about using AI generated images in blog posts instead of stock photos? In general, um, there's not a problem with this. There's not an SEO problem with this. The big issue is that you can't, you can't claim copyright to those images, you know? So if you generate an image and you put it on your blog, uh, other people could use the exact same one and you don't really own it. Uh, there's, there's gonna be some interesting things that roll out with AI, uh, with AI generated content as, you know, governments seek to sort of regulate and as, um, you know, copyright and intellectual property laws kind of come into the mix here. It's like, if AI generated it, who really owns it? Um, companies are like, well, you can kind of own it, but also only kind of, we don't own it, but you only kind of own it and you have no claim to it. If I take a photo, like an original photo, 
I own it. Um, and if anybody else uses it, I can, I can send them an email saying, hey, that's my photo. You either need to remove it, pay me a license fee for it, or at least give me an attribution link. And then what do you get? You get a backlink from another website that's legitimate because they use your photo. Um, so there's some, some real value in using your own photos. Stock photos, um, I don't know that stock photos are really any better than AI generated photos. I don't own the copyright to any stock photos I use on my site. I just have a license where I'm allowed to use them. So um, yeah, I don't get a ton of benefit from them. With AI, you can at least uh, customize the photos a bit. So uh, I guess I don't see a big problem with it, okay? I would, um, yeah, I, I'd go ahead and use it if it makes sense for you. I think for some niches, it's, it's not gonna work any better than stock photos and we're probably just gonna need to keep trying to take our own pictures. But um, anyway, there's there's a lot of cool stuff with AI that we can do and I'd say use it, but use it smart. Um, okay, this one's from the chat. Uh, Reverie says, hey, from India, if some articles of mine are crafted around Indian search intent, will it affect my SEO for the whole site and other articles so that the other articles only show for the Indian crowd? I don't think so. Um, with YouTube, that's kind of how YouTube works. Uh, you get like YouTube kind of figures out who your audience is and then they kind of stick you with that group of people. And so when you create content that's for one group and then content that's for a broader group, it's a little bit trickier. With Google search, they, they treat your articles independently, but they treat the authority of your website for its topic a little bit more as a whole. So, you know, if you're, authoritative in your niche, but some of your articles are um, targeted toward that Indian audience, it's not going to make it so that your other content only gets shown to them. I'll give you an example. Our website, suggestedbylocals.com, it's literally just all about, um, like, it's, sorry, it's all about answering specific questions about different cities all across the United States, uh, mostly for people who want to live or travel to those places. And, but it's articles that are written by people who lived there. So I have articles about specific locations here in Idaho, but I have articles about places all like small towns all over the country. Um, you could argue that, well, by doing that, is it making it so that Google thinks my website's about Idaho? And so it's only going to show up to people who are searching things about Idaho or from Idaho. And that hasn't been the case. I have articles doing really well about towns from very, very disparate places. No, I know that's all within the US, but still it's very targeted toward people who are searching about or from those specific locations and it hasn't been an, an issue. So I think you're totally fine. Um, all right. Um, okay. I've got here, Tutorial Lab says, how to compete in a high competition niche like website building. Um, how can I grow my blog by targeting, let's see. Website builder as a blogger because giant websites are writing about it. How do you compete or how do you grow your blog targeting those same keywords? The main thing is to, first of all, we need to stop worrying about keywords. Building a blog, if that's the keyword you're targeting, there's hundreds of search queries around building a blog. So what do we do? We look for those search queries that the big websites either are ignoring or are not covering very well. I'll give you an example. We have content about building a blog. That's what Income School does. But first of all, our, our blog isn't very active. And by not very active, I mean, like I probably publish on it a couple times a year. Most of what I create is here on YouTube and um, in Project 24. Um, but if I start, and I've been intending to for a while and we'll get there, um, if I start publishing more frequently on the website, I'm probably not gonna be covering specific things about specific plugins and specific um, themes and stuff like that, not very often. There are other larger websites that do, but they usually cover the really big, well-known ones. But there's still a lot of search queries around building a blog that the bigger websites, they're just going to ignore because they, they aren't the big, really high search volume search queries. And so what do we do? We start with those ones that are a little bit more long tail and we win some of those. And the more of those you win, the more authoritative your site becomes. Um, also big websites, this is true for anybody in any niche. The big websites often, when they do cover those, um, those search queries that 
you know, that aren't as, you know, huge or whatever, they usually cover them very superficially. I've seen so many articles on WebMD that are like two paragraphs long, but they rank because they're so authoritative. And so if there's nobody right below WebMD that has a really good piece of content, there's no reason that another newer website couldn't come in and rank for that as long as they build a little bit of authority in that medical space for that specific aspect of medical. Okay. Um, and then Marcus Erickson says, I'm thinking of entering a competitive niche, but to focus on less competitive terms that don't have a lot of traffic, the products have high recurring commissions. And so in that way, I don't need a lot of traffic to earn a decent amount of money. Yes, Marcus, I think that's an awesome approach. I've seen it. Um, we had a Project 24 member, we did a YouTube interview with him who with like 2000 page views a month was earning a full-time income. Uh, he was not using like an affiliate earnings model. He was using a lead generation model, but it was earning him great income. He didn't need that much traffic because it was very targeted toward that specific thing, but it was in a high, com high competition space. So building substantial traffic was, would have been really hard, but also just wasn't necessary. I love it. Um, go for it. Do it. Um, Saif Rai says, when is Jim coming back? I get this question a lot. It shows up in comments on YouTube a lot. Um, Jim, first of all, he moved away. Second of all, he left the company. Third of all, I bought his share of the company. Um, so like he's not coming back. It's, you know, it's, it's just, that's, it's not in the plan. He's doing his own thing now. Um, and he's doing really well at it. And we talk and he's an awesome guy. I love him. We're good friends. But um, when he moved away, we tried for like six months to run the company together, but with the whole team here and him remote. And it was, it was very difficult. And so we came to the conclusion that it was probably time to split it up. <laughs> and, um, and I know that people miss him. Um, I miss him too, in a lot of ways, but also like I'm kind of running project 24 and running income school in a little bit different way. So, um, anyway, so I'm moving forward in the direction that I feel like is going to be really good for us and for you. And I we're, he's, he's not going to be back at income school at some point. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if we interview him, uh, talk to him about what he's been doing since he's working on some cool, exciting stuff. Uh, he always is, but we talked recently and he's got some cool things in the works that he's excited for and I'm excited for him. And, uh, Anyway, just wanted to address that too. So I, I don't, it doesn't bother me that you guys miss him. Um, but I just want to clarify, this isn't one of those things where he just like stepped away for a while and he's going to come back. Um, buying somebody's half of your company is a huge investment. And so you don't just like throw that away and say, oh, come on back. Um, I spent the last two years <laughs> working really, really, really hard to pay him <laughs> for that half of the company. Anyway, so here we go. Um, okay. I better come go back to some of these that I got from comments. Uh, let's see. Sometimes it's hard because now with YouTube, um, the handles that they've given us, they're all like trunk, like crammed together. So it's hard to tell <laughs> like where one word ends. So I think this one is art, Adosi, art, artado SEO maybe. Anyway, he says a uh, question. Well, can you tell me what affiliate should you choose? I know you hate Amazon. So what affiliate should you choose? Um, I, and the entirety of the comment um, was addressing that this person had recently watched basically like all of our content in a short period of time. So a few years ago, um, you know, Amazon came in and they've done this multiple times, but they like completely changed their commission structure and then they cut commissions. Um, and it was really kind of crummy timing the economy was in a bad position. Um, it was like during COVID, COVID just started and suddenly Amazon's like, Hey, we're going to pay you less now. Uh, and they were probably in the best position of any company out there to continue paying people well. And so we did make a video saying, this is really scummy of Amazon. It's really not a good time for everybody else. We're generating tons of sales for you. And now you're just like, Amazon was built in large part off of affiliates in the beginning. Um, so, yeah, I don't love Amazon, but on the other hand, Amazon is uh, the highest converting affiliate program out there because people are so used to buying on Amazon. You can get really fast shipping, free shipping. Um, 
And so it's one of those things where if you completely ignore Amazon and don't have links to Amazon, you know, you might earn a higher commission elsewhere for the same product, but fewer people will end up buying. So what we often do is we will sometimes link to two different programs in the same blog post. We'll say, hey, you can buy this directly from the manufacturer or from that brand here on their website, or it's also available on Amazon. And we'll link to both and let them check the prices at both. Um, and that way we kind of get the best of both worlds. So when answering the question, which program should you go through? It really just depends on the products that you want to promote and where they're hosted. So I usually start from the standpoint of what do I want to promote? Um, I know a lot of marketers, a lot of affiliate marketers do it the other way. They say, oh, I really, really like um, share a sale. So they go on share a sale and then they start searching through and saying, well, what are the highest um, converting products right now? Or what are the highest payout um, products on share a sale right now? And within their niche, and then they'll end up picking those products and then promoting them. And I get that, that makes sense from a business standpoint, but from um, maybe kind of an honesty standpoint and building real rapport with an audience, I, I think it's better if you take it the other way around. So, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with knowing what pays out really well. And if there's products there, like really looking into them and testing them and saying, is this something I really would recommend? And if it is, cool, go ahead and promote it. But I usually start from the product side, find out where it's hosted and, I recommend the products I want to recommend independent of how much commission you earn from each one or how well that specific one converts. How a product converts on average really doesn't matter to me. A product will convert really well on my website or in my YouTube channel if I sell it properly and if I'm honest in my review of that product and not just selling what's going to make me the most money. Um, not trying to say that that's what you're trying to do. I'm just kind of something that is really common among a lot of affiliate marketers. Um, at, at Aaron Z. Woozy says, are free stock photos bad? Um, they're not inherently bad, but there's a lot of free stock photo websites that have a whole lot of photos on them that aren't supposed to be free. <laughs> They've been copied from other websites and stuff. And so when you use those, there's a decent chance that at some point some you're going to get a cease and desist letter from someone saying, Hey, you don't have the right to use that photo. And then you got to replace it. Usually there's no damages associated with that. You're not going to have to pay it. Sometimes, um, I've also found that when you use the free stock photo sites, especially you're more likely to become, um, a target of the scams out there. There's some big scams right now where people email, you know, they email you with a letter that looks very legal and very official saying they're from a law firm representing a client and you use this image without their permission and you need to attribute it to them and give them all sorts of money since you've been using it. And people get taken by this all the time. And um, typically it's if you're using those free sites, you're more likely to get uh, if you're using images from those free sites, you're more likely to be a target of that because you're more likely to believe it. I've received those emails before, but it's like, no, all my stock photos are from 123RF or other sites uh, where I have a license and I can go find that image and the license for it. And it's like, no, you have nothing on me. And I don't even respond. It's a scam 99% of the time. Um, at MZ Ilg says, MZ Ilg says, do you do coaching? Um, so the answer for a little while has been no, but um, my, t my team is very well, uh, trained and really well versed now. And so we're opening this back up for a while. It was just Jim and me, and we got to the point where we just didn't have the time anymore. So we stopped doing it. So at incomeschool.com slash private dash coaching, maybe I can, yeah. Um, I'll put a link later <laughs> in the description of this live, but incomeschool.com slash private hyphen coaching. Um, that's where you can order a private coaching session. We're also looking at opening up opportunities that are a little bit less expensive for us to do a review of your website where you tell us specific concerns you have and provide us with the sufficient information. And then we're able to go in and um, look at it and provide you with a bit of a plan to go forward. Um, but the coaching provides us doing that pre-work and then having kind of an hour long back and forth coaching call. Um, so we do that for blogging. We're also opening that up for video as well. Got so much experience on this team. Um, that's just, anyway, they're just awesome. 
And then another one here from uh, Middemb6879. Is it okay to change a website niche? I have a blog that was an education, but now I want to change it to music. Is it possible? Um, both on a blog and on a YouTube channel, you can adjust your niche. So on a YouTube channel, um, we have whole strategies for this we talk about in Project 24, but essentially um, you can pivot a YouTube channel. I know you're asking about blogging. I'll come right back to that, but you can pivot it. Typically though, it's a matter of kind of slowly adapting so that the your existing audience isn't completely turned off, but you start to build that new audience around the new content. Or you can do kind of a hard, like stated, you're just telling everybody, you make in a video, you say, hey, I'm gonna start making a bunch more content about music, so hopefully you'll stick around, but that's why this is changing. And then you just, boom, you just change it to what you want it to be. With a website, um, just add the new content you wanna add. You can leave up the content you had before. I would just kind of add new categories to your website and start filling them in with content. And you know, if, if you really don't wanna have the, any of the education content anymore, um, it might be better to just start a new website. And if you have opportunities to link from your current site to the new one, um, to point to content that's relevant, that could help boost the new one a little bit faster. But yeah, if it's a if it's a big enough shift and your current content's doing anything for you, uh, it can be it could be more valuable to start it as a, just a second website. But if it's reasonably closely related content, then just start adding some new categories and and move forward. All right, a couple more here then from um, the chat. What's your opinion on faceless videos uh, for the how-to area? So. Um, and I think this is asked a few different times in the comments on YouTube, basically. Can you do faceless videos for your blog content? Um, I've been talking a bit lately, and we've talked about this many times for a few years now, of using video content to help support your blog, especially with tutorials and how-to content, anything that would be really visual. Video content is a great way to really bolster your blog. Um, but can we do faceless? Because I just want to stay faceless. Yeah, you totally can, especially with a lot of how-to content. Uh, really what we're trying to do with video for the blog in most cases is provide a really helpful supplement to the blog. So when we're explaining something that's a tutorial and we put in some photos, that can that's helpful. But when you have a video showing those steps that you've described in words, um, that's even more helpful most of the time. So. It doesn't have to be showing your face. It could be, in many cases, your hands doing the thing that you're explaining. Absolutely. So there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you're trying to grow a YouTube audience, faceless channels sometimes work really well, but they have to be done right. They have to be done really well. Um, mostly because you're trying to build some rapport and connection with an audience, and it's hard to do that if they don't feel like they're getting to know you at all. Uh, but for supplemental content for your blog, Absolutely, faceless videos can do really well. Um, Carl asks, or when am I coming to affiliate gathering? I got your email, Carl, the other day. Um, I'm looking at the date. I need to kind of see how that lines up with my kids. I know um, I would love to come this year, so I'm gonna do what I can to get there. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, Carl. I'd love to be at affiliate gathering. I'd love to get out to more stuff and see more of you um, uh, just in real life. It makes a big difference. Um, Mr. XYZ says, I'm using Cadence theme with a Zoic and I constantly fail Core Web Vitals no matter what I try. I set up Leap and optimize my images um, by converting to WebP, yet you get a mobile score of 30. That's, that's a bit surprising. So um, it probably has to do with other plugins you're using or something. I have websites on Cadence and I have websites on Akabato and that are using a Zoic and on desktop, they're like 97, 98, 99. On mobile, sometimes they'll drop into the 80s, but it just, they're really good. So typically, you know, images are usually a big one. If you're uh, embedding video in your blog, we're gonna cover that here in a second. If you're embedding videos on your blog, that can slow it down a lot. So um, let's talk about that real quick. Um, chances are though, there may be something else in, in page speed insights, you can, um, really dive in to all the things that are slowing your site down. I would look at what some of those are, uh, 
it, sometimes it'll tell you specific scripts that are using a lot of um, a lot of time or taking a lot of bandwidth. Uh, but yeah, and with with Leap, I, I have a love hate relationship with Azoic Leap. Uh, sometimes it uh, will block certain scripts or delay certain scripts that really need to not be. <laughs> um, and so I end up turning some of those off or having to write a lot of exemptions and that kind of annoys me. Um, but it does help to use like their JavaScript and their CSS. Um, what do they call that compressor where they put it all together um, and, and put it all in one and put it out at the same time that can save you a ton. So yeah, but let's talk. I ha uh, wanted to answer about, embedding videos. How do we do that without slowing the website way down? There are a couple of questions here that I'm, I'm just going to answer all together. One person asked, they said, um, could they embed or should they post the video for their podcast on the same page um, on a blog post that has kind of a recap of the podcast? Um, yes, by the way, that is a good thing to do. Absolutely. Put them together on the same page. Another person said that, um, they were embedding videos on their website, but it's getting too much traffic. And their web host said, um, your website's going to slow way down because you have too much traffic. So they said that what they wanted to do was, um, not embed the video on the site, but instead put like a thumbnail image up. That's a link to YouTube. So they go watch it on YouTube. Um, I think if your web host is saying, Nope, you have too much traffic, it's time to upgrade or leave. Um, <laughs> chances are it's time to leave a lot of, uh, shared hosting platforms. They, they really do have to, um, if you're on kind of the low inexpensive plans, they'll, you'll get to a certain level of traffic and they're like, yeah, you're getting to be too much. So we're going to slow down your website. And that's frustrating. I have not run into that issue in a long time since we switched. Um, we've, we were on site ground for a while. Um, then we went to WPX. I really, I still like WPX. I think they're great. We had some issues with um, backend speeds, mostly because I think they got really popular really fast. Then we went to Big Scoots and the same thing happened. They got really popular really fast and it slowed down. Then they rebuilt up their infrastructure while everybody started moving off to Cloudways. So people keep like switching around from host to host. Those are all great hosts now, now that things have kind of settled and people aren't jumping around all the time. Um, WPX is pretty easy and inexpensive. Big Scoots is more expensive. Um, but also really great. I'm on Cloudways now. I don't think I'll, unless they make a big change, I don't have a reason to switch ever. If I ever have to increase, it's just a matter of like, it's not a huge increase. It's not like, well, you're going to go from $9 a month to $45 a month. No, it's like, okay, I'm going to go from 12 to 20 or something and get substantially more capability on my server. So, um, if your host is telling you, you have too much traffic, then, Great. It's time to upgrade. <laughs> um, okay. So back to, uh, videos though, this idea that we should put just the thumbnail on the page, but have it linked just out to YouTube. I don't love that. I want, um, I want Google to show my video in the search results and sometimes be sending people to my YouTube channel to watch it. But I also want them to, s to send them to my blog to watch the video. Cause I'd rather get them with YouTube. I'm usually trying to get people from YouTube to come over to the blog. So if they're already on the blog, I don't want to just, just send them back to YouTube. My solution for this is, um, there's a great plugin. It's called Presto player. There's a free version that can do a ton. It's awesome. It's made, uh, it was introduced to me by the creator who is Adam, um, from, uh, WP crafter, uh, great guy makes some really cool tools with people like us in mind. Cause that's who he is. He's not a developer. He's a normal user, right? Of uh, WordPress tools. And so he creates these tools and works with developers and creates the tools that we actually want. Um, and just does a fantastic job. Presto player will do this for you. So basically you can have it so that it takes your thumbnail image and it just, that's all that loads on the page until people click and then it loads the video. The reason that it slows down your website so much when you put in just a normal YouTube embed is it puts in like this iframe and it, it loads a, a lot more stuff <laughs> when, uh, when the page is loading. So it slows down your page speed quite a bit. But if, uh, if it's all only loading an image at first and then people click on it by then your page is loaded. So it only takes a few seconds to load up the video and 
it's still pulling in the YouTube video and Presto Player has the capability to add like a subscribe button for your channel right there in the video player on your website. So people watching your video can be like, oh yeah, I'll subscribe to that. And they don't have to go over to YouTube to do that. So anyway, I think it's a fantastic solution that we should be using. All right. Um, let's see. Abhishek Jadav says, I'm a budding blogger. And even after targeting low hanging keywords, still not able to rank on the first page. Um, so I would look at those low competition searches that you're trying to rank for and see who else is ranking for them um, and see is your content unique from what they have. The other thing too is, have you given it enough time? And the third thing is, have you created enough content around um, one or just a couple specific topics to build any sort of topical authority? So one of the uh, big, uh, I, I'll call it a mistake <laughs> that we made with a couple of sites a few years ago. And this is the reason Cook for Folks really didn't grow further than it did and why it started getting hurt when helpful content first started was because we just targeted a whole bunch of low competition searches, but we didn't look at all at topical authority. And back then nobody was talking about topical authority. It wasn't, um, it, yeah, it wasn't like a big thing and Google wasn't really penalizing for not building topical authority. It really was a lot more like, hey, if I have the best article on a low competition search, I'm gonna win. And uh, that started to change. Topical authority became more and more important. It was, it's just important to have enough content about a specific topic, usually meaning multiple articles, um, to be able to go deep on it and not just superficial. And so that's been limiting for Cook for Folks. And frankly, with all the projects that we do, we haven't added new content or really fixed that yet, even though I've been talking about that issue for a long time now. Um, we just have new projects. So anyway, I would say, look at that. Consider, are you building topical authority? Are you diving deep enough on those subjects? And that could be the thing that makes all the difference. Um, coming back to the questions I got before, um, Ian, um, Ian Hop fit. Ian Hopefe, the, the HR pro. Okay. Uh, he says, I know I shouldn't be doing a blog on HR, human resources, because it's too YMYL. Um, but I'm a HR consultant. As an expert in this, this is what I love. Do you have any general tips for this industry? First of all, I wouldn't consider human resources overly YMYL. YMYL, I would say, you know, where we really need to be concerned is if we're trying to get into something really medical or financial, like we're giving people advice on how they spend their money or legal advice, those kinds of things. Um, HR, a little bit less. I get it that there's financial and legal aspects of HR, but I think you're a little bit more on the side of YMYL, not really into it. So I think that's okay. Also, you're an HR business, you're an HR consultant, right? Um, so you actually do have expertise in this field, which you can lean on. So I think that's helpful too. Um, so once again, I would start with you know, find a few areas of HR where you could really dive into one topic or another, then find those search queries, do your search analysis, make sure that we find at least some that are really low competition, but also make sure you cover the really important ones, even if they're high competition, the ones that are foundational to HR in each one of those topics, cover those as well. And I think you're gonna do okay. Um, and just recognize that if it is kind of YMYL or competitive, that it's probably gonna take a little bit longer and a little bit more work to to get really successful with this. But I, I mean, I think you got a really good shot at it. So um, here I have another one. I have a YouTube channel with an audience, but I want to pivot to a slightly different audience. How can I do that on YouTube and my blog? So I talked about this a little bit earlier. If it's a slightly different audience, I would just kind of start making videos that should still appeal to the current audience, but that are also driving toward the new audience. So when we're, when we're trying to figure out what's gonna to appeal to the right audience that we wanna build on YouTube, like I filmed a video yesterday for channel makers about this, talking about the YouTube algorithm, but essentially we're trying to um, figure out what the people who, sh who we think should watch our videos, the audience we're trying to target, what kinds of things are they watching? What's the kind of tone that they like? Um, what are, you know, you know, finding other channels that have um, similar characteristics to what you want, even if they're not in your industry and seeing like, what is it about 
their channel that seems to be attracting the kind of audience that you would want. Um, and learning how to incorporate that into your videos. And so it could just be a matter of, if it's just the niche that you wanna make a slight shift to, just start making that shift in your videos. Um, and I think it's gonna be just fine. And on the blog, same thing, just kind of add another category of content that is in that new space and start creating um, several articles in that in that new category and and you got it um let's see ruth lb7085 says is it worth it to do a blog into languages this one's interesting up until probably yesterday i'd have said probably not because google um more and more they've said that they're getting to the point where they're just gonna um offer the same search results like They'll, they'll offer me search results in any language and just translate it for me. Uh, but I read just yesterday, Google answers this question fairly recently. <laughs> they said, um, you absolutely can, and it should, and it's, and it's valuable to do so. Um, writing blogs in two different languages, bilingual blogs, if the audience that you're targeting has people that speak both languages, um, basically Google's like, even if everybody in your audience can speak English, um, or if most of them can speak English, uh, people still prefer to read content in their own language. And I think Google knows that um, if it's written in their language, it's probably gonna be better than what their Google Translate can do. So anyway, Google says, yes, there's value in doing this. Depending, I would say on a couple things. One, how much work is it for you to do that, to create it in both languages? Uh, is, is that worth it? And that is, ties in a little bit to part two of that, which is, is the second language group as, is it big enough and is it valuable enough to justify the extra work? So if I were targeting a US-based audience because advertisers really like, you know, they like US consumers because we spend a lot of money uh, and so they pay a lot for it, right? You're targeting the US, but you know that within the US there are a lot of people that speak other languages. And let's say your second language is Spanish, but you're still mostly targeting the US audience with your content. Like the information itself is mostly for that group. Um, then you just need to decide, okay, well, are, is the Spanish speaking population within the US, within my niche, uh, is there enough people there in my niche and in the, in that region? And is there going to be sufficient traffic as well as sufficient monetization methods to justify the added work of writing everything in two languages? The other thing too is like, you know, if it's just saying like, no, I'm writing to the whole world and it's English and Spanish. Well, okay, that's a ton of people, but is the content you're writing going to be relevant to somebody in the U S as well as in Australia and England, but also equally relevant to someone in Honduras and Ecuador and Chile and Mexico. Um, usually there's going to be some differences in how I would approach my writing and what kinds of things I would talk about. It's going to depend on your niche too. In some niches, it's, it's easier to write to a much broader demographic because it, it's applicable equally. Whereas in a lot of other niches, like if I'm writing about off-roading and I'm talking about specific um, off-road vehicles and stuff, those are going to vary widely from different, from place to place. And I've even had people tell me like, off-roading isn't that relatable to me because I live in a country where you can't off-road. <laughs> like it's just not something you can do. So uh, anyway, just a few thoughts there. Um, okay. Here's one, this is quick. Um, Kyle and Karina Holden asked, uh, is it important to use the nofollow attribute in the HTML when you're putting affiliate links in your blog posts? Um, it was for a long time to, you're supposed to put no follow for affiliate links. Um, the no follow attribute just basically tells search engines. This isn't like, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't a vote in favor of this other website. It's credibility. This is just, I'm linking to something. Uh, a couple years ago, Google came out with the sponsored tag instead of the no follow tag to be more specific. So when you're linking to a product that you're being compensated for, um, we should use rel equals sponsored instead of nofollow. Uh, so yes, use that. Um, I 
haven't seen a lot of penalization for not using it. However, it's best practice from an SEO standpoint, and I'm doing it um, for my affiliate links as well. A lot of um, themes and stuff have that kind of built in as one of the options. Uh, when you add a link, it's like open a new tab and then, you know, rel equals no follow, do follow, sponsored, those kinds of things. Um, okay, skipping over a couple. I'm almost done with the, uh, the ones I got from comments. By the way, there were some questions that some of you asked in the comments that we decided not to answer here because we're going to do probably a video in the near future where people are uh, or where we're going to be able to answer that question in more depth. So just stay tuned for that and we'll do more of this in the future. This one um, asked by a lot of different people. <laughs> Can you embed other people's videos in your blog posts and does it help? So short answer is yes, you can. Um, on YouTube, you can watch any video you want. And if it has a little, if one of the options under the video is share, then you're allowed to share it. And that includes embedding it on your own website. So click share, it'll give you embed code, or you can use um, just either in Gutenberg, WordPress, they have their YouTube block um, where you just put in the URL for the YouTube video and it'll grab it. Or Presto Player is kind of the same way. If you're going to use that to speed up your website, um, they'll you'll just you just need the URL for that YouTube video and it'll pull it in. So then, does it help? Yes, it helps. It's better than nothing. Uh, it's kind of like adding um, photos, or especially it's better than adding. I would say stock photos. <laughs> it's but it's kind of like having photos on your blog if it's really relevant to the content. It can be really helpful to make your content better, which can help it perform better from an SEO standpoint. Um, on, it's, and it's just like, it's free other media. You don't have to pay for stock photo. You just grabbed somebody's YouTube video. On the other hand, video is a great way to build rapport and authority with people. And so if they're spending time watching somebody else's YouTube videos on your website, yeah, they're spending time on your website and your content might rank pretty well, but they're building a relationship with this other person <laughs> with their own YouTube channel. And so that they might end up just kind of going to that person for the your, for your topic uh, from now on. They might just go to their YouTube channel instead of your blog. So there's those trade-offs there and that's why it's a lot better if you can create your own video content to do it. And then Long Fizzo says, do you have tips for getting comfortable with industry outreach as a non-native English speaker? Yeah, I think there's a lot of ways to do industry outreach. I talk a lot about getting interviewed on a podcast and that's great, but it's harder if your, you know, your English isn't great and you're not comfortable yet. Um, I would say, I would say practice if you can, you know, try to have conversations in English where someone asks you questions and you answer them, uh, just get more comfortable with it. I, I know how hard that is. Um, I spent two years in Brazil and speaking very, very, very little English while I was there. And it was incredibly difficult for a while until I got practiced enough to where it was very, very comfortable for me. But it takes it takes time and it takes a lot of effort. And so I, I'm, I'm not saying that um, ignorantly. I understand what it takes. Uh, um, on the other hand, there are other ways to do industry outreach. We cover several in our EEAT course in Project 24. Um, but participating in social media is a big one. If you just go, you know, create a Facebook page um, under the name of your brand. Some Facebook groups won't allow brand pages to join them, but um, create a Facebook page and go join groups within your industry and just participate. Ask questions, answer people's questions, go do some polls. Um, you know, you can ask a question and treat it like a poll, right? Like, hey, what do you all do for this? And just see what all the answers you get. And then you use that information as original research in your blog post. That's not quite the same as industry outreach, but it, it can be, because then you can kind of go back to that same, um, either your original post and reply to everybody, or you can go back just to that same group and say, hey, um, thanks for all your input. Here's, you know, here's what I was able to create. And just be upfront about it. You can say, hey, everybody, I, you know, I blog in this space and, you know, I'm looking for some cool uh, images from people that do what we teach or what, you know, what our niche is, but I, but I want to see some unique applications of this. Anybody want to share some photos? And you'd be amazed 
how many times we see people who are just like, yeah, I'd love to, here's, here are my pictures of this. Here's my pictures of that. Um, so as long as it's a group where that's allowed, there's some groups where you're just not allowed to even mention that you have a blog or links at all. Um, I once, you know, said, Hey, I, you know, I was answering somebody's question and I said, yeah, I use this product, no link at all. And then they're like, Oh, well, where do I get it? What's it called exactly? And so I just linked to it on Amazon, no affiliate link at all, just a link. And I got silenced for a week. <laughs> so um, there are some groups on Facebook that are pretty strict that way, but they're not all that way. And so participating in that way can be a great way to build brand recognition. People will eventually click over to your page. Um, I've talked about this a few times on YouTube. My mom started doing that with her quilting business a long time ago before they ever had a shop. My mom and sisters just opened up. Uh, my mom just built a brand new big giant building they opened up this new store front. They had a store here in town that like they, they rented like an old convenience store, like a gas station um, that was emptied out and they turned that into a quilt shop and it was just packed with stuff. And so they built this new big building and it's only been a couple of years and they had this grand opening of their new building and they had a line way out the door and the building was just packed, almost impossible to move around for the first half of the day. And then it was just after that, the rest of the day was still filled with people. It was just nuts. And it started out and they have a following like all over the world now. Um, and they do most of their stuff through Facebook. Not even they, like their blog has all, has, like, is like nothing on it. Their YouTube channel is mostly empty, but they do lives on Facebook and Instagram. And I, I tell you, it works really well. And my mom started out by, she created a page for JK quilts and she just started going into quilting groups and helping people and answering the questions that they ask the group. And by being incredibly helpful, she built a reputation. And now she has people literally shipping quilts to them to go ahead and to, to do the quilting on their long arms and ship them back from all over the place. They have people ordering kits from them and ordering stuff from them instead of Amazon. Um, anyway, it works incredibly well. All right. I'm going to take a few more. Uh, in fact, I'm going to scroll. I know, um, there we go. And I'm going to take a few more here live. I know we've gone a little bit over the hour, but we're going to keep going here. Um, yeah. Ricky's mom is an influencer. Yeah. She kind of is now, um, in the Facebook lives, it's actually two of my sisters. And I got to tell you, like use what you have, right? Two of my sisters are identical twins and people in my family are, we're good at kind of picking at each other in silly ways. And we grew up with kind of a sarcastic sense of humor, which I know to some people's not a high level of, um, of humor, but, um, and then my dad's just like all about the dad jokes, which is where I get it from. Um, but these two sisters of mine, they're identical twins. So when they sit there and they're like showing, they're demonstrating something live on Facebook and they're kind of every now and then kind of picking at each other and there's kind of a banter that goes on and it's just like people just like watching it. They don't even have to care about learning whatever they're teaching. They're kind of gleaning some knowledge there and hanging out with my sisters who are identical twins. Um, you know, and it's just really funny because I do this and I was doing this before they started that and still like, they don't, <laughs> they don't watch my stuff. They're doing it their own way. Um, and it's kind of cool to see the way that they're doing they, they ask me every now and then like, we should be doing this. How do we do this? And I tell them and they're like, oh yeah, we should, but we don't have the bandwidth to do everything because um, they're mostly running a store. Anyway, it's just, it's amazing. They're teaching these classes live. It's like, you realize if you live streamed that class, you could probably charge an entrance fee and you'd probably have 5,000 people attending every single one. Um, so anyway, just, uh, <laughs> just some things. They could learn from me, but I'm also learning a ton, a ton from them uh, because they're doing things differently than how I typically do. So yeah, my mom's an influencer. There you go. Um, let's see. Juan Sebastian says, I have a three-year-old website that had 14,000 views with only 20 posts. I stopped working on it for a year and a half and it went down to 4,000. I added 10 more posts, but it keeps going down. What can I do? So at this point, there was a time a few years ago where 20 posts, you could do pretty well. We've had websites with 30 posts get to... 70,000 page views a month and $4,000 just in affiliate revenue. But that was like five, six years ago. Um, 30 blog posts just isn't that many blog posts in today's world. 
in order to build real topical authority. So that's one of the things I kind of addressed earlier in this live is each of the topics you cover on your website, like let's say those 30 posts kind of cover maybe two different categories of content in your niche. Um, you know, maybe that's fine. But if it covers like, if you have 30 blog posts that kind of cover the entirety of your niche, chances are that you don't have content that dives really very deep. And when your content is superficial, Google considers that thin content. So even if an individual blog post answers one question really thoroughly, that blog post isn't thin content, but the website itself overall is just surface level and fairly thin. So that's where we have to be willing to include some content that's maybe really highly competitive search queries, but it's the really important foundational information. Just include it. That way you show Google that you have knowledge and authority within your space. Um, and so that's, that's probably what it is, is you need more content at this point, but be strategic about it. Don't just go write 300 blog posts. Let's make sure that we're covering like one aspect, one cluster of information um, and cover all the search queries you can think of, <laughs> or at least 10 or 15, right? And um, put those together, interlink between them, just make it really clear to Google. All this is interrelated and I'm going really deep on this topic and that will build that real topical authority. Um, let's see. Muhammad says we're experiencing article inflation and hundred articles won't make it these days. I don't think that's necessarily quite the case. Um, I just think that we just need to get more focused with the content we create and we can't just throw articles on a website. We really need to make sure that each article does offer unique value to the internet, something beyond what's currently there on the first page of Google, but also that we build topical authority and that we create resources that are, uh, that are especially helpful. That's really the main thing. Um, Rinsler saying cover the algorithm, algorithm update. I actually did talk about that a bit earlier in this live. So, um, catch that in the replay and you know, we'll, we can continue talking about it. But again, the main thing is, you know, if you got hit hard, slow down, take a step back, try to look at what is it that got hit, what pages lost, um, uh, you know, what pages are what lost uh, the most traffic, you know, did you have articles that I think a lot of times we end up with a few articles that drive most of the traffic to our website. And so one of those articles goes from position two to position 10 or disappears altogether because um, it's kind of redundant. There's other articles that cover the same thing that we're doing better. Um, and since that one article drove so much traffic, we're done. I met with a guy a few years ago um, Jim and I had dinner with him and we were talking about his website and it turned out that like 80% of his traffic was coming in through one article and he was making a full-time income from this website. But then that article got outranked and he lost a bunch of the traffic to that article, but that cut the traffic to his whole website in half. And so this is a person who was living on the income from his blog and suddenly it's not enough money anymore. Uh, that's a really risky situation to be in. So for all of us, like, let's look at our websites and let's figure it out. Like, do we have one, two or three articles that are driving the majority of our traffic? If so, we need to work on spreading that out a lot further and having more articles that are of a quality of those ones. Uh, Marcus says, what are your thoughts on using a persona with EEAT? I guess Google doesn't like it. Um, I'll have to look because up until Pretty recently in Google's quality rater guidelines, they explicitly said personas are fine. But I do think that with the persona, it's usually harder to, um, to build real EEAT. Google would rather see a real person and a real organization behind the content. So, and I do think that what you're saying, Marcus matches up with the direction Google has been going because you know, a couple of years ago, yeah, persona was fine. But nowadays with what they're trying to do with helpful content and, and, um, authoritativeness behind, you know, the content on our websites, I think it's, uh, I think it's becoming more and more and more important for there to be a real person or a real organization behind your content. So I think you can do it, uh, using a persona, but I think we need to take the steps to, establish legitimacy. So 
you can use a pseudonym. It's kind of like an author, you know, uh, Mark Twain's name was not Mark Twain. And I think if you were to do it the way that he did it, which was, you know, he's Mark Twain to the world and, you know, people knew who he was. He went on tour as Mark Twain, literally doing stand-up comedy and, you know, like, but he was Mark Twain and Mark Twain was him. But Sam Clements was who he really was. And, you know, I think we could do the same kind of thing. You can use a fake name. You can even use a fake photo for yourself. Um, but then have that fake person, that persona be based on reality, um, be based on real personality and real experience. I, I shouldn't make up a persona that says he's a doctor and pretend like I'm a doctor. Um, I should, if I'm going to use a persona, I should use a persona that's a version of myself. And I think there you're going to be okay. And then you can create, you know, a Google voice phone number. You can create, uh, if needed, a PO box or a virtual address or something, um, so that you have, and, and those can be tied to that persona and stuff and just build legitimacy around it and have that be a real person, just not that real person's real name, or maybe even that real person's real photo, if that makes sense. All right. Um, all right, the questions won't stop and I, I get it. Um, uh, and I wish I could spend more time. And, and yes, Rensler, I will, um, I will go through once this uh, live stream, once the replay is ready. Sometimes they take a while for me to get to do that, but um, I will go back through and I'll be timestamping basically each of the questions that I covered. Uh, I like to do that, especially for YouTube live so that it's easy to find the answers to the questions that you have. So, um, so there you go. And, uh, I'll just take a couple more. Adam asks, is it necessary to no follow index, um, for categories on a website? Um, and by that, I, I think by no follow index, it's just, um, you know, set those to not index those category pages. Uh, and you can do that in rank math. You can do that. It's basically just adds in the robots.txt file, it tells the search engines, yeah, don't index category pages. Uh, sometimes people won't index the media URLs for all the different images on their website um, to help save on the crawl budget a little bit. Or, you know, if you want your images to show up in image search, you should let them get indexed. Uh, so there's, there's those kinds of things there. Category pages, I'm, it's kind of up to you. I, I'm, I'm not that worried about it. It's not something that's going to make a drastic difference on your website either way. If having, you know, one of your category archive pages from your blog show up in search would be a bad thing, then yeah, no index those. But there's just not that many of them. So it's not really going to impact your crawl budget um, very much. I just don't think it makes that big of a difference. So if people are making a big deal about that kind of thing, they're probably looking beyond the mark. Um, and... Let's see. I think, I think we're going to call it now. <laughs> I, I could just go all day. Um, maybe one of these days I will. One time we did a 10 hour, um, and one time we did a 10 hour YouTube live answering questions all day long. It was pretty awesome. Um, you know what? I'm going to give a little bit of an update here at the end on some of our websites. So Revival asks, how is our Patent Rebel site going? You know what? That website has basically been steady since we bought it. Um, we haven't done a lot to it. We did recently, or a little while ago, add a little bit of content around um, trademark and copyright that I thought that I hoped would do well. Um, it hasn't done much yet, but I'm going to go through and look at it and and see if it needs some interlinking and to build some topical authority. I think there's some good opportunity there for um, for trademark and copyright mostly because there's good affiliate opportunities for those where there isn't a lot with patents. Um, but honestly, that's a website that I would be perfectly happy to sell to someone who's in that space. I think it would be incredibly valuable for someone who is an intellectual property attorney and wants to generate leads for their own business. Um, Jim told me, I assume this is true. He told me that lawyers aren't allowed, like I can't sell leads from Patent Rebel to a lawyer. But if it was that lawyer's own website and it generated leads for them, I think that would be fine. So anyway, I think it could be incredibly valuable for someone in that space. Whereas, um, you know, for me, it's mostly just some ad revenue. Um, but we haven't put a ton into it. I did a redesign on the website a long time ago. I think it's a lot better now. 
And then uh, we added a little bit of content, but that's about it. We've mostly let it sit because we've been focused on other stuff. So update on our other projects. Our two big projects this year, our project charity, which is Terrain Treaders, the website. Basically everything that we've done publicly, like that's visible on the website right now, I did on the channel so you can see it. I built the website on the channel. I designed the homepage, doing a YouTube live. Um, I literally wrote the one blog post that's published. I literally wrote it on camera um, in a competition with uh, with ChatGPT. <laughs> and uh, that's where that one's at. Now, we've written a bunch of other content for it that's kind of just sitting at the editing stage. We've, um, with our writing, our own writers and editors and stuff, their primary focus is typically on customer content um, over our content. So our content often kind of sits. Uh, but also with that website, um, I want someone with in-depth knowledge of off-roading to review the content before we publish it. And um, that's one of the reasons I hired Jake uh, for the team. He's actually my brother, but he's got a ton of background with that. He's also probably going to be the primary driver behind the YouTube content around train treaders. And so part of it too, is I'm getting him really up to speed on the blogging side. He knows a lot now about video, but, um, just kind of getting him up to speed. And so there's a bit of a learning curve there for him too. It's anyway. So that's why that one feels like it's just kind of sitting. It's not just sitting. It's, um, it's in progress. It really is. Uh, like I said, we've got a bunch of content that's not published. The one article that was published was actually winning the, um, it was one of the three articles showing up in the Google, um, search generative experience, which was kind of cool. It's an article, it's a website with one article on it. And it's still like, was one of those, uh, top ones picked, um, which I, I don't know, I think it says something about the article. Uh, and then the other one is project double time. So let me give you an update on that one. That website has 40 articles on it. Um, not a lot, not as much as it should. It should have 170 or so. Um, this year got away from me really fast. So, you know, back in February, we started building out our new office and we had to leave our old office. Actually, we started building out the new one slightly before that, but we had to leave our old office for three and a half months. And I thought, okay, during this time, I'm going to have fewer distractions. I'm just going to get to work uh, on the blog content. That turned out to be completely the opposite of true. Um, filming for income school ended up becoming more time consuming because I didn't have the setups that I was used to having. Um, but also the work to build out the new office ended up taking a lot more of my time than I expected it to. And so I spent a lot of hours here doing work, um, literally on <laughs> this new office. Um, and it just, it was, it was big. It just took a lot. Um, coordination with the team took more time, more effort. Um, so that got away from me. But I, and then we had obviously back in um, late June, we had Nate leave the team and that threw a bit of a wrench in sort of the work process for all the rest of us and with channel makers. So that ended up being a huge drain on our time and, uh, so for the next month and a half, which puts me into mid August, that was, uh, that was something we were getting figured out. So you can see why now, <laughs> uh, I didn't get a lot more done than I did. I'm not trying to make excuses. However, where we're at there is, uh, YouTube was always part of the strategy. It was from the very beginning. It's just now becoming a bigger part of the strategy for that website and that brand. I just barely finished a challenge that I set for myself. You can hear all about it on our new podcast, Creator Files, that started um, basically the same time I started my challenge. But the challenge was to publish 30 videos in 30 days. I um, filmed all those videos. I edited most of them myself um, and did all the planning and everything that, that wasn't like a huge team effort where I had a bunch of people helping me do it all. Uh, I wanted to see if I could do that every day for 30 days and see what it would do to a channel. And that channel is off to a really good start, especially considering it's now like 35 days old and not even 34. It's off to a really good start. Uh, now I'm shifting my focus to maintaining that channel and getting back to the blog content and trying to build out some really good um, resource pages on that website that I could point people to from the YouTube channel, 
which is a tremendous strategy that we'll have to talk about more on this YouTube channel. And also uh, working on coming up with a really good offering, some sort of info product that I could push out um, before the end of the year <laughs> to try to hit my uh, monetary goal for that website. So um, these are all uh, projects that are still very much in the works. Nothing's been dropped. Um, so we're, we're still working, working hard on those things. A uh, couple of questions here. Um, Manoling Martinez says, nice painting in the back. So this was in um, China and it's actually a photograph that Jim took. So, you know, if you see photographs around our office in any of the rooms where we film, um, the photographs are all photographs that Jim took. There's a reason we did that, by the way, and it's because uh, other people's artwork showing on the walls in our videos could be a copyright infringement and the creator of that artwork could potentially ask us to remove a video if they don't want their painting showing up. So there's a legal reason why we're using our own artwork. So we printed out a bunch of Jim's photos on canvases a long time ago. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, but it's awesome. And I, again, I'm almost certain that he said that was in China. Um, and JL asked a question, I get this question a lot. What percent of people that have signed up for Project 24 make it to full-time income after two years? The answer is, I really don't know. Um, at one point, and I should do this again. At one point, we did a study where we looked at the timing of when people report milestones, which by the way, people only report milestones when if they want to. And so we have a lot of members who literally sign up for Project 24, do the coursework, but don't really participate in the community. But they do the coursework, they build their blog, they do everything they're supposed to do, and they just do it. And they just move on with their life. Um, and they aren't very active in the community. They're not submitting milestone reports. And I know about that because I hear from those people oftentimes later saying, oh yeah, I did that. Um, but it's like they never submitted a milestone. But we did do a study where we saw how long it took people to hit um, curry day or pizza day. And then what percentage of the people that did the, that reported hitting pizza day, what percentage of them hit $100 and how long it took? What percentage of them hit $500? and what time it took, and then a thousand and then full time. And that was a couple years ago. So I need to do that again. I remember the numbers being awesome, like super happy with it. But um, there was a, uh, there was a huge like drop off between $0 and pizza day. And there's two things that account for it. Either People signed up and they just do the coursework and they just don't ever report anything, which I think is true for a lot of people. But there's also the people who pay for it because they intend to do it and then life gets in the way and they don't ever do it. And we just never hear from them again. They sign up for Project 24 and they never did anything. And so I don't know what happens to those people because all the numbers are self-reported. I can't tell you what percentage of people that signed up make it to full-time income. So anyway, I'll redo that study though because I think it's much more telling to determine what percentage of people who get, who get to pizza day and report it also end up reporting full-time income. The other thing too is there's no way to report it if you're not still a member. So if somebody pays for one year and then leaves, but then still hits it within their 24 month period, I don't know. I'm never gonna hear that from them. So the numbers are a lot more complicated to get than people give us credit for. So when I'm criticized for not publishing that number, it's because it's impossible for me to gather. So, um, but thanks for asking. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's all I have time for today. Sorry. <laughs> I would keep going. I'd keep going. I just love hanging out with you guys. Um, anyway, so thank you all for participating in this, uh, live with me today. And, uh, I'm excited to keep working on these projects and keep making awesome content for you. And, um, and thank you all for your support and for being a part of this community. Uh, we'll see you all soon.